Something's watching through the window, watching you and watching me. Wants what we have, wants to be us. We know that can never be. Something's waiting, getting closer, watching, waiting for its day. Something needy, cruel and greedy, keep that hungry thing at bay. Speak to us. We're listening. What is your name? Good. You remember. We want to help you, Rel. Tell us where you are. is listening. Hey kiddo, Siege here and today. Well today I thought it a perfect time to delve into the true horror that resides within Warframe, but this time more so regarding why the man in the wall, known throughout the game as the indifference, is actually as unnerving and horrifying as it is. And further, why that term in particular is so significant when trying to analyze exactly who or what it is. Over the course of the game, it's implied by multiple characters that the presence the Tenno are first introduced to during the War Within quest is viewed in a very specific manner, called as such in more than one unrelated event. The indifference has awoken, and all of the Void's creations must find a light. It was so cold, indifferent, inhuman. If Rel was Tenno, what did he become without Margulis? Being more closely expounded upon during the Chains of Harrow. Rel's warnings, those dire consequences. He was talking about void exposure, wasn't he? The effect it has on human minds is well understood. But it's not. This isn't some kind of deep pressure bends as Margulis suspected. Rel saw what it was, truly an entity, indifferent, old as stars. Becoming a reoccurring entity within the Warframe universe, and as of this writing, only appears to be growing stronger and more influential over time, potentially being revealed a bit more in the upcoming Whispers of the Wall quest, fueled by quite a lot of evidence the trailer of the upcoming quest being the first, but also something Rebecca mentioned during a recent dev stream. Uh, Steve, what are we looking at here? Well, from what Rebecca told me, yes. uh, what we're looking at here is the way we want to approach the tile set. This mm -hmm. is a space that uh, Albrecht Intradi has uh, hidden away, and this is where he was doing some what we're calling failed experiments, things that were hidden from the family above, and for that reason, there's going to be things there that uh, will, will surprise the Tenno and others. So we're really looking forward to getting this sort of gothic Frankenstein's lab meets sci-fi meets eldritch horror space. That in my mind seems not only confirmed that the man in the wall does have some Lovecraftian aspect, but it also makes the usage of the term indifference while describing him extremely significant. Now the idea of an indifferent god isn't anything new, and as most know, it's been utilized many times within different media over the years. In fact, Kalulu, a giant cosmic entity with a chimeric form encapsulating the features of an octopus and dragon, but with a humanoid aspect as well, who was first introduced in the 1928 fictional short story, The Call of Kalulu, by what most consider to be the father of Lovecraftian horror, H.P. Lovecraft himself, hence the naming convention, and is still to this day the most recognizable avatar for most as a representation of an all-powerful and more importantly, uncaring deity. Now before you give me any crap in the comments about my pronunciation of the word, listen to this. Cthulhu. Cthulhu. Yeah, I thought it was Cthulhu too, but well, this is how you say it. The real question is, however, aside from the obvious unsettling appearance, why is this idea endured as such a mainstay of horror over the years? After all, when looking at the term indifferent, it merely refers to the act of lacking interest, enthusiasm, or concern for a thing, something I'm guessing the vast majority of us can say we too have experienced, be it from a new piece of media that we're not really into, or in the most extreme of cases, 
lack of concern for others in need. And it's in that aspect that the horror of indifference begins to surface. Eli Weisel, an American-born Romanian writer, may have put it best when he said, the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, it's indifference. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. The idea of an uncaring or oblivious God is not uncommon and seems to be one that many wrestle with, even in our own world, but why? Well, for many, it's a fear manifested on two fronts. The first being one that most of us understand implicitly, while at the same time trying to ignore the obvious negative connotations of reality that when existing in a world without a god or within one with a god that does not care, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. No one watching over us should the worst occur. Personally, I think it's captured perfectly in a particular movie quote from the 2002 movie Signs, where Graham, the protagonist played by Mel Gibson, is forced to try to comfort his younger brother, Merrill, portrayed by Joaquin Phoenix, during what appears to be an alien invasion, with lights permeating the sky and crop circles manifesting all over the planet. Graham, a former Christian minister himself, emphasis on the former part, tries to offer solace, but having been taken himself by indifference explains his position on the existence of a higher power. He states, People break down into two groups. When they experience something lucky, group number one sees it as more than luck, more than coincidence. They see it as a sign, evidence that there is someone up there watching out for them. Group number two sees it as just pure luck, just a happy turn of chance. I'm sure that people in group number two are looking at those lights in a very suspicious way. For them, the situation's a 50-50 could be bad, could be good, but deep down they feel that whatever happens, they're on their own, and that fills them with fear. But there's a whole lot of people in group number one. When they see those 14 lights, they're looking at a miracle, and deep down they feel that whatever's going to happen, there will be someone there to help them, and that fills them with hope. See, what you have to ask yourself is what kind of person are you? Are you the kind that sees signs, that sees miracles? Or do you believe that people just get lucky? Or look at the question in this way. Is it possible that there are no coincidences? And while this is immediately met with hope, he goes on to explain in his own words the emptiness of indifference, brought about by the untimely death of his wife years before. He continues after he's asked what he believes, saying, I never told you the last words that Colleen said before they let her die. She said, see. Then her eyes glazed a bit and she said, swing away. Do you know why she said that? Because the nerve endings in her brain were firing as she died and some random memory of us at one of your baseball games just popped into her head. There is no one watching out for us, Meryl. We're all on our own. This, this sentiment is one I'm sure is shared by a great many people and it's in this concept that the dread of indifference can be shown. The idea that nothing matters in the grand scheme, so why care? Now take that concept and apply it to an all-powerful entity, maybe even the personification of an entire universe, and ask yourself, when you walk down the street, do you worry at all about the ants you may have crushed, potentially destroying entire communities without even being aware of the act? That along your path today to work or school or wherever, that you may have engaged in unspeakable acts of genocide without the faintest clue of having done it. To you, well, of course, this is nothing. What could you do? But to the ants, well, to them, Lovecraftian horror isn't just a concept. It exists, and it is this concept within the idea of indifference that makes it so terrifying that a cosmic entity could eliminate the totality of our existence in the blink of an eye with what might seem like a mundane act. At least from the perspective of the entity, of course. Or perhaps even worse, cruelly torture or needlessly deceive. Feeling better, kiddo? I killed him. Isa. Did you know? Is that how you remember it? Yes. Good. For the purpose of their own amusement. But in regards to the man in the wall, that's not all of it, is it? Anyone who's, let's say, had the privilege of having him visit, 
also subconsciously understands that he preys upon our own innate human fears as well, employing what is commonly known as the Kubrick stare, a look that while not originating from the filmmaker Stanley Kubrick himself, is typically associated with him due to his utilization of it. This look generally signifies that the character in question is either really, really pissed or really, really deranged, and the person they're looking at is really, really screwed. That passage, I believe, very directly explains the message you get when seeing this look, be it in film or media, or even in Warframe. This, of course, is presented on an exact copy of our own created Tenno, but different, of course, playing into the age-old fear of the doppelganger, or double walker, described as a ghostly or paranormal phenomenon, and usually seen as a harbinger of bad luck. Other traditions and stories equate a doppelganger with an evil twin, and to me at least, the most concerning aspect I've always wrestled with personally is, where is he when we don't see him? After all, I think the new war confirms that he is real in some way, so with that in mind, where does he go? I mean, how would you feel knowing there's a mischievous deity using your exact likeness to do whatever he wants out there? Or perhaps worse, what if... He's always in the room, watching, always just behind you, just far enough back to be out of the camera's view. This character is also aided by the inclusion of aspects of analog horror, with almost human or humanoid entities with exaggerated smiles or inhuman eyes, venturing into our inherent displeasure at the unsettling nature of seeing a face that's almost normal, but not quite in typically some unpleasant manner. This again adds another layer of uneasiness to our natural discomfort when viewing the effects of what is known as the uncanny valley, something typically associated with the uneasy humans feel at seeing a robot or some type of fictional media appear close, but again, not quite human, creating an uncomfortable or even disgusted feeling because of it. And once the uncanny valley has been reached, many will feel uneasy, disturbed, and typically afraid with the patience the man on the wall exhibits in particular only adding fuel to an already creepy fire as he just sits there, staring back at us, typically vanishing should we look away. I've said in the past that I believe the argument can be made that he is the literal embodiment of Frederick Nietzsche's famous quote, if you gaze long enough into the abyss, the abyss gazes back into you. With what appears to be a literal abyss within his eyes, the window to the soul, some say, with D.E. actually having changed the look of his eyes multiple times over the years. Is this meant to signify the changing void as we continue to interact with it? Or is it merely them updating facets of the game? And why? It's tough to say, but regardless, the fear of the unknown, in this case, the cosmically unknown, with a god who may have appeared to have our best interest in mind, but in hindsight, more so gives the impression that he's really only amusing himself, if looked at critically, is only increasing as time goes on. The look we must adore when he appears on our ship, one specifically shown to trigger our innate fears, typically precluded by the quintessential jump scare, or in this case, is what is known as an acoustic blast, designed precisely to elicit what's known as the startle response, or a largely unconscious defensive response to sudden or threatening stimuli, such as sudden noises or sharp movement and is associated with negative effect. Usually the onset of the startle response is a startle reflex reaction. Hey kiddo, don't you do so well. Did you feel it? Well, if you did, now you know what I'm talking about. But after all this, did you ever consider that he is the manifestation of our own projection of fear itself? The only thing it's been said we have to fear. Everything about this character, both in-game and out, is designed to prey upon our fears, both conscious and subconscious. And if there were ever a time, oh, I'd say around Halloween, would be one of the best to fire up the Chains of Harrow specifically and reminisce about that time we brought our own personification of fear into reality. It's a really creepy quest, too. And with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this dive into the idea behind the indifference and why the horror of the man in the wall actually exceeds the borders of the Warframe universe to tap deep into your own psyche in order to manifest fear. Now before you go, 
I'd like you to consider the line of text that precludes Nietzsche's abyss line in his work, Beyond Good and Evil. A fitting title that I want to expound upon in a future video, but for now, he says, Anyone who fights with monsters should take care that he does not in the process become a monster himself. And I wonder if there isn't some greater lesson at play here that the Tenno should take heed to. After all, when fighting evil in life, it's exceptionally important to keep our humanity, what shred of innocence we have left intact, as this may be the only thing that differentiates ourselves from the monsters we engage. And I made mention in a previous video how it appears as though the choices in the game are awfully similar to the concepts of analytic psychologist and philosopher Carl Jung's ego and the shadow self. One I encourage you to check out as it's one of my favorite, dealing with real world concepts within the Warframe universe. And I wonder if the man in the wall's design and development didn't come about using similar methods. Because in the end, we must not in any situation lose our light, even in the face of Armageddon, or worse, surrender to indifference, because that's what it wants after all. At any rate, I hope you all have a wonderful day today, a wonderful rest of your week, and I'll talk at you all in the next one. Take care, everybody. Bye.